So hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the 2022 Peggy Smirchler Sem Leadership Seminar. My name is Alice Chang. I'm a senior at, the, um, at Harvard College. Um, I've been an intern at the Harvard College Women's Center for two years now, and my pronouns are she, her. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sawyer Taylor Arnold. I'm a junior at the college. Um, I'm also an intern with Alice at the Women's Center. This is my second year as an intern, um, and my pronouns are she, her. So on behalf of the Harvard College Women's Center, we'll be, we'll be moderating the seminar along with representatives from the Association of Black Harvard Women. Um, if you guys want to introduce yourselves. Yeah, hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. My name is Kyra March. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a senior at the college. And I'm also the senior representative for the Association of Black Harvard Women, also known as ABWA. And ABWA is a social and pre-professional affinity organization uh, for Black women, Black families, and Black, and Black people who identify with womanhood on this campus. We're so excited to be hosting this event with the Women's Center and are really excited to speak with Professor Ross today. So before we get started, we wanted to begin with a land acknowledgement. Um, so I acknowledge the land that I am currently occupying traditionally belongs to the Massachusetts people, the indigenous inhabitants of what is also now known as Boston and Cambridge, and still belongs to them. I acknowledge the history of U.S. colonization and militarization, not only here in Cambridge, but also in the broader United States, Pacific, South America, Africa, and Asia. And I honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples across the world today and their ways of caring for both land and water. And though we are in this virtual space, I encourage you all to recognize and respect the land that you are currently occupying and the histories of indigenous peoples who have always been there. Uh, may we work together to restore these lands and waters. Thank you, Alice. Um, so today the Harvard College Women's Center is really excited uh, to be hosting this event. Um, our mission at the Women's Center is to promote gender equity by ways, raising awareness of women's and gender issues, developing women's leadership, and celebrating women who challenge, motivate, and inspire. Um, and today we are really excited to further that mission through this event. So the Peggy Schmerchler Leadership Seminar um, is an annual event which honors Peggy Schmerchler, who was a strong advocate and one of the reasons that we even have a Women's Center at Harvard College today. Um, a graduate of Radcliffe at her 35th reunion, Peggy began to inquire about what Harvard was like for women um, and her inqu inquiries uncovered a reality that motivated her to ensure that the Harvard um, would come closer to its aspiration than the Harvard she knew. So through her leadership, uh, the Committee for the Equality of Women at Harvard was founded to continue to challenge the status quo of inequality of women on campus. This group was charged with supporting the administration um, to increase the number of tenured female faculty and advance equity and access for women across the university. Peggy's continued pres presence and support helped to advance this group's charge throughout its 30 year existence. Her tenacious spirit, unwavering vision and dedication to women's advancement inspired many and, pr and prompted her former colleagues and husband of 44 years to partner with the Harvard College Women's Center in honoring her legacy through this leadership seminar. Um, so with that, we will turn it over to Abla. Yes, so we're so delighted to honor Peggy's memory and her dedication to empowering women at Harvard with our Schmetzler honoree, Professor Loretta J. Ross, and if everyone can give a virtual round of applause. So the dedication, the passion, and the care that Peggy Schmertzler and Professor Ross had and continue to have for their communities are similar things that the founders of ABWA um, had when creating this space for Black women on Harvard's campus. And, you know, looking at this lineage of change makers, you know, allows us to gain a better understanding of how we can continue this fight for liberation um, in our everyday lives today. And so I'm sure that Professor Ross's words today will ignite a flame in all of us to continue to do the work um, and stay committed to our causes. And with that, I'm going to introduce our incredible guest. So Loretta Ross is an award-winning, nationally recognized expert on racism and racial justice, women's rights, and human rights. Her work emphasizes the intersectionality of social justice issues and how intersectionality can fuel transformation. 
Ross is a visiting associate professor at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, in the program for the study of women and gender, teaching courses on white supremacy, race and culture in America, human rights, and calling in the calling out culture. She has co-written three books on reproductive justice, which are Undivided Rights, Women of Color Organized for Reproductive Justice, which is the winner of the Outstanding Book Award by the Gustavus Meyer Center for the Study of Bigotry and Human Rights, Reproductive Justice, an Introduction, a First of Its Kind Primer that provides a comprehensive yet succinct description of the field and puts the lives and lived experiences of women of color at the center of the book, and then finally, Radical Reproductive Justice, Foundations, Theory, Practice, Critique. Her current book, Calling in the Calling Out Culture is forthcoming. Ross appears regularly in major media outlets about the issues of our day. She has recently featured in a New York Times piece, what if instead of calling people out, we called them in. She was a co-founder and the national coordinator from 2005 to 2012 of the sister song, Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective a network of women of color and allied organizations that organize women of color in the reproductive justice movement. Other leadership positions have included national co-director of the April 25th, 2004 March for Women's Lives in Washington, DC, which was the largest protest march in US history with more than 1 million participants, founder and executive director of the National Center for Human Rights Education, Program Research Director at the Center for Democratic Renewal slash National Anti-Klan Network, where she led projects researching hate groups and working against all forms of bigotry with universities, schools, and community groups. Founder of the Women of Color Program for the National Organization for Women in the 1980s, and then leading many women of color delegations to international conferences on women's issues and human rights. Ross is a rape survivor, was forced to raise a child born of incest, and is a survivor of sterilization abuse. She is a model of how to survive and thrive despite the traumas that disproportionately affect low-income women of color. She is a nationally recognized trainer on using the transformative power of reproductive justice to build a human rights movement that includes everyone. Ross serves as a consultant for Smith College collecting oral histories of feminists of color for the Sophia Smith Collection, which also contains her personal archives. She is a graduate of Agnes Scott College and holds an honorary doctorate of civil law degree awarded in 2003 from Arcadia University and a second honorary doctorate degree awarded from Smith College in 2013. She is currently pursuing a PhD in women's studies at Emory University in Atlanta. And finally, but most importantly, she is a mother, a grandmother, and a great-grandmother. So everybody give it up for Professor Ross. Oh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's such an honor to be here to talk to y'all today. You can tell I'm a Southerner with the use of the word y'all. So unfortunately, the Southern mannerism stripped from <clears throat> my tongue. I'm currently a professor at Smith College and living here in Western Massachusetts, looking out on this snowy landscape we're all enduring right now. And I think it's supposed to snow again tomorrow. So I'm like, oh my God, why did I leave that, leave Georgia <laughs> and, and all those wonderful peaches to come up here, but I'm okay. I'm hoping that we do this presentation through a series of questions instead of me just talking. Yes. And I'm so sure. why don't I shut up and let y'all offer the first question? Of course. So we first want to you know, start with getting into how you started. So how did you get your start in activism? And just can you talk us through your journey um, from then to now? I'm 68 years old now. And I became a conscious activist when I was 16, when I first got tear gassed at a demonstration in Washington, DC, because I went to Howard University in 1970 to major in chemistry and physics. So I tend to call myself an accidental feminist because I had no intention of becoming 
a social justice or human rights activist. Uh, there were things that happened to me in my early life, which was the rape and the incest when I was in the 10th grade. And so obviously not having control over if and when I'd have sex, whether I'd have a baby, abortion was not an option once I became pregnant from the incest. So I ended up having that child and my only choice was whether or not to give him up for adoption. And I chose to keep my son. So I went from being a scared pregnant teenager to a mother. Like It, it felt like overnight because it was not planned. It wasn't until the morning after he was born that I even knew I was gonna keep him because I had really liked the idea of giving him up for adoption so I could get back to my regular high school life kind of thing. But um, I don't know if I should be telling this story, but my mother always said, tell the truth and shame the devil. I had actually been offered a full scholarship to Radcliffe College. Uh, I was uh, one of the National Merit Scholarship finalists for that year. And so Radcliffe had offered me a full scholarship in the 10th grade because they were cherry picking the, the, the brightest young black students across the country at the time. But once they heard that I'd had a baby, they withdrew the scholarship offer. And so only because of that did my feet get directed from Radcliffe College to Howard University. And it was at Howard University that I ended the, the the discussion of black radical politics, because the two books that they put in my hands my first year of 1970 were The Black Woman by Tony Cade and the Autobiography of Malcolm X. Putting those together was when I began to develop my black feminist consciousness, my radical black feminist consciousness at that. And so it was hard in 1970 to ignore what was going on in the broader world, particularly around racial politics. Uh, Washington, D.C. had rioted after King had been killed and there were riots still taking place because there was so much police violence still taking place. And so I remember attending a demonstration against police violence in my first month of being in Washington, D.C. And that's where we got tear gas. And then I understood that that was more than just <laughs> something people talked about. That stuff actually hurts and burns and stuff like that. But I'm very glad that I went to Howard University. They probably saved me from becoming a total nerd because I majored in chemistry and physics. And I could imagine that I probably would have been stuck in a laboratory somewhere at Radcliffe where at Howard University, I was forced to live in the community because I didn't, I, I applied, I had to apply for Howard so late that I didn't get a dormitory room because they had already been, so I actually lived in the community uh, more so than living on campus. And so I, that was also influenced my early activism and stuff. So I was a mouthy 16 year old who thought I knew everything. I was very lucky though, that the more seasoned activists that I was working with both in the community and on campus, they didn't give up on insufferable me. Uh, and Washington itself was in the middle of fighting gentrification, fighting against apartheid. Uh, the first rape crisis center in the country was founded in Washington, DC in 1972. And so it was a wonderful place to develop my black feminist consciousness because I had so many generations of black feminists before me right there in the city, people who knew Mary McLeod Bethune or, you know, I got to meet Dorothy Height. I mean, just all of these black feminist legends were the people that I had to work with and do organizing with when I was a, you know, a mouthy young teenage organizer. And so I certainly benefit to this day that I learned my understanding of feminism through the lens of black feminist icons. It wasn't until you know, 12 or 13 years later that I 
got my job at now and I had to work with white feminists. I was like, oh, this is a different world <laughs> kind of thing. But I came there with a lot of security in the black feminist theory and practice that I had enjoyed for so many years before I got to now that I wasn't at all threatened or put off. I just, I just thought it was an opportunity to do something different, which is why they asked me to start their Women of Color program. Mm, that's amazing. And I know that you mentioned uh, the different types of abuse that you faced on the ground. So I was wondering, what have been the most difficult parts of being committed to activism, but also um, the most fulfilling parts of the work that you have done? The most difficult parts have been to not only survive the trauma that I went through, but not let the people who traumatized me leave their dirty fingerprints all over my life story. Mm. You know, cause I wanted to be more than what happened to me. And so I'm constantly, even today, fighting the remnants, the legacy of that trauma. Cause you know, when, you, when, when stuff happens to you when you're a child, it's, it's there for life. The only thing that you, get better at is management of the trauma, but it never actually goes away kind of thing. And if you're not paying attention, it can still come and, you know, blindside you while you're not, you know, when, when you're not in active management of it. So that has been the hardest thing to manage. When I, I went to college for three years, I dropped out at Howard University. I didn't graduate from Howard uh, because it became very hard to become a to be a full-time student, a full-time mother, 19 years old, majoring in what we call Death Valley, chemistry and physics. And it just felt so overwhelming at the time. Well, it took me 35 years to get back into college. So I always regret not, you know, not sticking to it when I was 19, but it was, it was very, very difficult back then. And so I'm very glad that I did eventually, you know, get some therapy and get some help outside of my own head to work on the, the, my, what, what I had been through and how it was affecting my life. And the other thing that I learned about myself is that I was using my social justice activism as a way to keep from dealing with the stuff that was going on in my head. Mm. I was basically saying that if I'm doing good stuff for the community, the fact that I'm a mess inside can be hidden mm. <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> and so learning that that is not a survival strategy is not a good thing, but that's what I learned at 25 when I crashed and burned and mm -hmm. actually went and got some professional help. And so those were the things that were hard, but I, the things that were good was that by doing social justice, human rights activism, every dream I've ever had has come true. You know, I've seen 60 or 80 countries, you know, representing you know, women of color or black women in the women's movement and the feminist movement. I've been in some of the most important places where human history is made, whether it's at the, you know, participating in the election of Nelson Mandela in South Africa, or going to the Philippines and struggling with Gabriella as they overthrew the Marcos dictatorship, or even being in Dubrovnik in, in, in the former Yugoslavia when the war broke out in 1991 mm -hmm. or something like that. And so I know that I have truly not only survived what happened to me, but used it as fuel for making a difference in the world. I, I, created these, I create a lot of slogans, so forgive me if I sound like a cliche, because I am one. But <laughs> I believe that activism is the art of making your life matter. Mm. And that's what I've tried to do. I use my activism to ensure that my life matters. And I think 
I can say that I left the legacy in terms of working to end violence against women, creating, <clears throat> co-creating reproductive justice, <clears throat> bringing, building a center to teach people about human rights here in the United States and reaching a million people, or right now, you know, trying to pioneer a new human rights-based movement around calling in the calling out culture. I'm really enjoying the fact that I can see how my life has made a difference, not only for me, but in the lives of others. And so, you know, that's a real, I don't wanna say satisfying feeling to have. Oh, well, that's absolutely well, beautiful. I'm sure that's a joy. And I, I feel like what you said was so powerful, especially when you were discussing how you were trying to shift away from the trauma consuming you. Because I feel like a lot of times, uh, especially with younger people, even when we think about the way that we're taking care of ourselves, you know, a lot of times we allow, we don't address these things, especially people of color and women of color. We like to push things to the side. You know, people say, oh, she's so strong. They're so strong, you know, strong black women, you know. And a lot of times we're not centering ourselves and taking care of ourselves like we should. I think that's a, an amazing segue to the next question that I have, which is uh, even now, and I know you touched on this a bit when you were talking about seeking help um, and different things like that, uh, but how do you prioritize self-care and centering yourself in the work that you do um, so that you can keep going, uh, especially when you've had such a long career? Well, <clears throat> The short answer is badly. <laughs> I didn't get the memo on self-care till it was almost too damn late. Mm. Because I, I am that boomer generation where we were taught that we we're supposed to sacrifice for family, for community, for society, and you know, the feed yourself people for whom they have to put the airline warnings on, you know, when they tell you put your mask on first before you mm -hmm. try to put the we didn't get that memo. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to put a mask on everybody else first. And then you last. <laughs> right, exactly. And so I never will be an avatar or an exemplar of, of self-care. I've just recently started prioritizing trying to take care of myself, but I'm, you know, I'm in the last third of my life, so it's a little late. I kind of like the fact that when the third wave feminism started, that it was really focused on combining self-care with obligations to the community and to family and stuff like that. So it worked to achieve more balance. But for me, the definition of self-care is not about how you indulge yourself or how you mm -hmm. spoil yourself. I see that very capitalistic form of self-care yeah. you know, being marketed to us so that somebody can, you know, make a whole bunch of money off of the stuff that's happened to us. Mm -hmm. I tend to see self-care as how well do you take care of the mess that's inside your head, <laughs> you know, and not use what has happened to you as an excuse to inflict trauma on others. Mm -hmm. You don't get a pass just because you've been through something mm -hmm. because everybody's been through something, <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> I tend to see, well, you know, who, uh, who was the professor with Eliza do doodles and why do they deal with the mess in their heads? <laughs> well, I actually feel that way myself, you know, about how we cannot build a hu human rights movement and have it end all forms of oppression if people practice these oppressive tactics within our movement on each other kind of thing. Now, that's easier said than done because it is the most traumatized people that are attracted to the human rights movement. If they ain't been through stuff, they wouldn't want to join the movement. So we got that as a given. But knowing that, that still doesn't give us license to practice our revenge, our anger, and our hatred and blaming on each other. 
generally speaking, you're even practicing it on the people who didn't even mess with you. <laughs> you know, it's just that, that trauma-informed lens and response is all you know, and so that's all you end up doing uh, kind of thing. And so I think as a movement, we need to become much more analytical, mm -hmm. uh, recognizing that the purpose of the human rights movement is to end oppression, not to provide a personal therapy space for you. And a lot of people come into our work thinking that, that we're, you're supposed to make me feel safe, comfortable, protected, free. And we're like, yeah, no, nope. can't give you that one. Mm -hmm. You know, because let me tell you, if being oppressed sucks, trust fighting it is also dangerous. <laughs> it's never going to be safe, comfortable, but you will find your best self in that struggle. You know, you will find that instead of fighting for the right of owning more, you'll be fighting for the right of becoming more. Mm. And, and that will reward you like no material good could ever achieve and stuff. But so I, I tend to be the tough love talker when it comes to building movement and what we think. I mean, and, and I take that over into my classes. I don't offer any trigger warnings. I don't promise you that you're not going to get uncomfortable information. My job is to, is to understand that I have basically two choices. I can protect you from the truth or I can teach you how to handle it. I choose the latter. Mm. That's amazing. I know today there are a lot of times, you know, when you think of critical race theory or even intersectionality, people try to twist things. Um, they try to twist the way, the, the theories and the concepts that we've come up with in order to explain our oppression and explain our experiences. And so what have you seen throughout your life? How have you seen people twist uh, the concept of reproductive justice and what have people gotten wrong about the concept? Well, 12 Black women created reproductive justice in 1994 and I was one of those 12. And we created reproductive justice because we wanted a human rights based way to talk about what we wanted from reproductive politics. And what we want from reproductive politics is a couple, you know, three basic things. First of all, we join with the pro choice movement in fighting for the right to use abortion and birth control. We, we share that agenda. But because it was created by Black women who are always stereotyped based on eugenical ideas and population control ideas and stuff where our fertility is always seen as a problem for America after 1865, I wonder why. Now, <laughs> you know, we have to fight for the right to have the children that we want to have and the conditions under which we want to have them, which includes using a midwife or a doula or resisting an unnecessary cesarean section or medical intervention or that kind of thing. And then the third tenet of reproductive justice is to fight for the right to raise our children once they're here in safe and healthy environments. And neither the pro-choice nor the pro-life movement puts enough emphasis on what happens to the kid once they're here. And so mm -hmm. we talk about you know, safe neighborhoods and gun violence and environmental problems and climate change and tax policies and zoning policies and land use policies. And basically every field of human endeavor has an impact on how we can raise our children in safe and healthy communities. And so reproductive justice is the right to have a child, the right not to have a child and the right to parent our children. And so it's a much more capacious or expansive framework then the pro-choice, pro-life binary just only focused on abortion. Mm -hmm. And it became a very popular framework because I think a large number of people who weren't Black women had been exhausted by the paralysis of the abortion debate as if that was the sum total of what we needed from reproductive politics and stuff. And so, and because it was based on the human rights framework, 
it went beyond the limits of the US Constitution, whereas it talks about healthcare as a human right or economic justice as a human right or environmental justice as a human right. So we were able to use the norms, standards and legal regime of the global human rights movement to make demands that are not available to us under the limits of the US Constitution. And so it became a very popular framework. And one of the things I really appreciate about it is though, although it was created by black women, it doesn't only apply to black women because mm -hmm. it's a very universal framework because it's based on uh, the, hum the human rights framework. And we all, you know, every human being has the same human rights. It's just that our intersectional identities, which speak to our vulnerabilities, determine what we need from the human rights framework. Uh, the best way I have to explain it is that all children have a human right to an education, but a blind child might need her books in Braille. So she doesn't have more human rights. She has special vulnerabilities that need to be attended to so mm -hmm. that she can enjoy the same human rights as a sighted child. And that's the way you're supposed to use intersectionality to identify those vulnerabilities that must be attended to so that you can enjoy the same rights as people without those vulnerabilities. But so many people mistakenly think that intersectionality, another brilliant theory by black women, is only a statement of identities, not a statement of vulnerabilities. Mm. And, and so they get that wrong. And so it's been a joy to watch the unfolding of the, re of the reproductive justice framework. This was something that Black women created for ourselves by setting ourselves in the lens. We had no idea that it would reverberate so broadly and become the dominant framework within you know, less than three decades for how people want to talk about reproductive politics and most astonishingly, what impact this had transnationally, mm. you know, where people in Ireland use reproductive justice to repeal the criminalization of abortion, or people in South Africa using it as the framework for which they wanted to establish their entire reproductive public health system on and things like that. And so it proved again, you know, that ideas can march from the margin to the center, like Bell Hooks wrote and be quite transformative. And so it's really been a joy to watch, you know, how indigenous people, when they talk about reproductive justice, they're talking about sovereignty, right? When trans people are talking about reproductive justice, they're talking about gender identity and body autonomy and non-reproductive issues, because not everybody mm -hmm. wants to have children, that kind of thing. And so it's really, a joy to watch its expansiveness, its flexibility, its adaptability, and how people are seeing themselves in this framework uh, that, that we didn't plan on. It, it just happened once we started talking about what our needs were as Black feminists in that particular moment in 1994. Mm. Thank you so much. And continue this conversation on concepts. Can you talk a little bit about how the concept of calling in um, and calling out came about for you? Well, I have to honestly say it came about because I'm such a boomer. I have a grandson who 10 years ago apparently didn't know how to answer a cell phone because every time I called, it went straight to voicemail, right? <laughs> And finally, when I finally got him on the phone, mm -hmm. he said, oh, Grandma, get on Facebook. That's the way to talk to me. So I get on Facebook, but the minute I get on Facebook, he migrates off to like Snapchat or something <laughs> more trendy, claiming that Facebook was for only for old people now. But I stayed on Facebook. And what I noticed on Facebook was how mean people were to yeah. each other, how unbelievably rude people were and I became convinced that people use the anonymity of social media to say things they wouldn't dare say to another person mm -mm. face to face and so it was bringing out some of the worst behaviors that I'd ever witnessed and so when I asked a young person I was working with 
what was going on. She said, oh, you mean the call out culture? And my first response was, y'all have named it? Because <laughs> I didn't know it was a thing. And so she said, yeah. And I said, and so I said, well, what are y'all doing about this? Because I mean, in the 70s, we used to trash each other. That's what we did, the women's movement. And I remember, you know, hearing from what people did in the 60s, but nothing like what I was seeing now amongst the social justice movement, where it's a complete circular firing squad, where people are, you know, performing wokeness on each other and all this other stuff. And so when I asked her what they're doing about it, and she said nothing, that's when I started processing all of my experiences, because when I ran the DC Rape Crisis Center here. I was a rape survivor and I, yet I went into a prison to talk to men who'd been convicted of raping and murdering women as a way of calling them in to end violence against women. 20 years later, I was at the National Anti-Klan Network, renamed the Center for Democratic Renewal, calling in people who had left the white supremacist movement like the Klan and the Aryan Nations. And yet I was a survivor of racial violence too. And so I thought that I'd been through some stuff that might provide useful lessons for what we're going through now. That we have to not treat everyone who disagrees with us as an enemy. Mm -hmm. That we're supposed to have diversity of opinions and diversity of thoughts in order to be a movement instead of a cult. But somehow this perception of rigid orthodoxy has taken over both the left and the right as if that's the only way to be in the movement. And it is poisoning our social discourse with each other. And I'm not that concerned about what's happening on the right because I do anti-fascist work. I actually want to overpower and defeat the right. <laughs> you know, I'm not trying to make them better, but I am concerned about what's happening on the left and in the center mm. where we're where we're turning off all of our potential allies by the fact that we are so intolerant of differences of opinion and different strategies for getting to the same goals of justice, freedom, and, and human rights. And so, that, so for the last six years, I've been writing on a book called Calling In the Calling Out Culture. And if I keep my fingers crossed and my discipline up, I'll turn it into Simon & Schuster this spring and they will make it available in the fall. Yes, fingers crossed. We're going to be so excited to read that. Oh, I should say that. Meanwhile, I teach and discuss this online through my website, LorettaJRoss.com, because there's a, there's a growing community of people eager to learn techniques for how to call each other in. And so you can always join our community, online community, discussion community through my website. Definitely, I'll make sure to have someone put that information in the chat so everybody can have that. I mean, the next question that I have for you is what do you think are some current events that we should be paying attention to in terms of reproductive justice um, and the human rights movement right now that are really pressing? Well, see, I tend to think everything is connected to each other. I think we need to pay attention to climate change, to reproductive justice, to racial uh, violence, to all of those things. They're all connected. That's why I consider myself part of the women's rights wing of the human rights movement, but I'm also part of the racial justice wing of the human rights movement and the disability justice wing of the human rights movement. So I see it all as connected. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I'm most concerned about right now is the health and state of our democracy. Mm. Because it's so frail, it's so fragile, has been exposed by the last five years that if we don't attend to strengthening that, then we won't be able to fight over any issue. We won't be able to win over any issue because we will not have the scaffolding in which to have the conversation. Yeah. Because we're up against an eliminationist mindset. People who want to eliminate us from the franchise because they don't want to share democracy. If they can't control it, they want to destroy it. Mm. And that concerns me. And so what I'm 
really urging people to do is first of all, recognize that even though we're, fe we're feeling very overwhelmed right now, I really wouldn't wanna play the hand of our opponents, people who are opposed to human rights. Because the people who are opposed to human rights, they mistakenly think that they're fighting us, the human rights movement. But their foes are a lot bigger than us. They're fighting history. They're fighting truth. They're fighting evidence. <laughs> you know, they're fighting time. Mm -hmm. And I think any one of those forces could kick their asses. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wouldn't want to be in the movement fighting truth, evidence, history, and time. So that's actually on our side. <laughs> Mm. even though it feels very hard when we're up against such ruthless people that seem to have all the power and all the money and all the things going their way. But when you really think about it, I wouldn't want their hand because I don't want to be the one trying to make time go backwards or to permanently bury evidence or to permanently have to lie to people so that I can deny the truth or to tell a, a revisionist history about what mm -hmm. people can see with their own eyes about January 6th and make it stick. I would not want to play that hand. And so to drill down specifically, I think one of the most radical things that young people should do right now is understand how voting rights is a young people's issue. As a matter of fact, I'm really in, impatient with the fact that it's always phrased as a civil rights issue for black people but they're doing these voting suppression campaigns in large parts of the country where there aren't even a sizable number of black voters. Mm -hmm. You know, why would you have a voting suppression campaign in Iowa or Idaho or Vermont or whatever? It's because they're afraid of young white voters who won't go their way because every white demographic at the 2020 election voted for Donald Trump except one the 18 to 29 year old, they voted for Biden. They broke with history and they broke with their parents. And so I'm convinced that a large part of this voter suppression is aimed directly at those white 18 to 29 year old voters, which is the same group of people that they don't want taught about critical race theory. They don't want to exercise their reproductive freedom. They don't want to, to have them focused on climate change. They are trying to control the future by brainwashing young people. And so that would be the number one issue I would say work on. Get people to understand that if they take away your right to participate in democracy, then all that other stuff you're fighting for won't even be on the table for you to fight for it. Because you will have no way of having those conversations. So it sounds pretty cliche to say voting rights is everything right now, but it feels very urgent for us to understand that how fragile our media institutions, our educational institutions, our political institutions, our social institutes, all of these things are hovering on the brink of being totally deconstructed by people who do not want them to work or function. Uh, and, and particularly on behalf of the people. And that's why we have to, we can't change the minds of those people in power, but we can change whoever the hell is in power mm -hmm. through our vote. No, exactly. And I feel like there are a lot of people who say, uh, oh, why does everybody say that voting is the key to, to everything. And I feel like what you explained just now was perfect in response to statements like that, because I don't really think a lot of people see how interconnected everything is and how important the people in positions of power are to the way we literally live our everyday lives, what we engage with, what we see, what's being taught in the curriculum and all these different things. So thank you so much for that amazing answer. Okay. I also think the women's vote is trying to be suppressed too. So it's not just young people's votes. It's not just the black vote. I don't think they want the women's vote uh, as well. Uh, they don't want, you know, majority of this country supports abortion rights. They don't want that majority 
to express that at the ballot box mm -hmm. kind of thing. And so it, there's so many ways that they're conducting this multi-front war. And yet we sometimes remain siloed as if these issues are not all connected to each other. Mm. Thank you so much. The next question that we have for you is how do we reconcile calling people in um, with keeping people, especially those in, in power, accountable? And when is it, you know, when is it the time to polite, when is politely trying to call people in simply no longer effective? So, you know, when is, when is someone a lost cause, if you will? Um. I have no problems with calling people out now. I'm not saying we never call people out. That's what the human rights movement does. Mm -hmm. We call out countries. We call out dictators. We call out human rights violators. That's what we do. But people who know how to do human rights activism know it's not the first thing we do. Mm -hmm. it's, the re it's the last resort, not the first choice. Because first we try talking to them. We try demonstrating. We try appealing. We try a whole number of strategies so that the call out is the last thing we do, not the first thing we do kind of thing. You see what I'm saying? And too yeah. many people don't have the patience to go through all those other steps. So they just want to jump to the call out canceling mm -hmm. impulse. Uh, I teach what I call the five C's. You know, the, the first C, of course, is calling people out, which is publicly shaming people for something you think they've done wrong or believed wrong or said. The second C is canceling people where you want them to suffer their loss of job or their platforms or whatever. The third C is calling people in, which is really a call out done with love because instead of using anger and blaming for holding people accountable, you use grace, respect, and love to yeah. pursue accountability because you're not letting them off the hook for the harm that they've done. You've just chosen not to use the weapons of the prison industrial complex mm -hmm. to achieve accountability. The fourth C is calling on people. This was created by Sonia Renee Taylor, where you call on people to do better, to be better you know, to rethink what they're saying. And you can do this without making an investment of your time and intention or attention, which calling in or out requires. And the fifth C of the, my continuum is called calling it off. Deciding when investing further in a conversation is so counterproductive that you just need to walk away, whether mm -hmm. it needs to be on online or in real life. <clears throat> and so, Yes, there are times when we need to call out people. I also think that there's a directionality about it because we should be punching up, they say, holding people with power accountable who have abused their power. And, but, but after you've given them a chance to do better though, not just assuming that they can't do better or assuming that they're not human beings that you can talk to simply because they have power and authority. You know, we tend to dehumanize people who have power over us because we don't see them as human beings. We, we react to their power status or their economic status or their celebrity status or whatever it is. We tend to dehumanize them because of our own issues with power and authority as opposed to see them as human beings. Or, you know, or we could act like them and punch down which is to take advantage of the fact that there are people who are more vulnerable than we are and we can bully them without any fear of consequences. You know, kind of like a, a victim of racism turning around and becoming homophobic mm -hmm. or a victim mm -hmm. of transphobia being misogynistic, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Or we can punch sideways, which is to assume that we're in this competition for political purity, who can use the right words, who can use the right gender pronoun, who can use the right this, who can perform their wokeness better than anybody else. Let's use the most socially desirable language so that everybody can see that I'm hip, I'm in, I'm this, and, that's like, and there's a lot of sideways punching to, to the call out culture. So I think that calling out 
has its uses. I just think it's overused mm. when it comes to trying to build a human rights movement and achieve accountability. And by the way, it doesn't even work because if you think somebody's done something wrong and you come with them with a call out in anger, blaming and shaming, all they're going to do is either ignore you or double down, deny that they even did anything wrong. So you thwart yourself by the way you're trying to achieve accountability. Because why would anybody want to have a dialogue with you when you come at them so in such hostility? You know, shaming them, belittling them, and trying to weaponize your knowledge against them. You are much more likely to get people to reconsider their points of view or their words if you come with come to come at them with grace and respect. Instead of saying, I can't believe you said that, why not just chill a minute and say, that's an inter interesting point of view. Tell me more. Mm. Invite people into a conversation instead of a fight. That's the way you build movement. Thank you. That was amazing. I think that was definitely necessary to differentiate, especially what you do first. I, I've definitely seen firsthand how a call out culture, using that as the first step in holding people accountable can definitely lead to some very interesting conversations and people not even really committing to creating the change because you've just come in, you've come at them in a certain way. So that was extremely helpful, especially for me. I want to add too that I didn't even create the concept of calling in. One of my colleagues, Long Tran, when they were 18 years old, they oh, wrote wow. this article in Black Girl Dangerous about calling in and, and accountability. And I read across this article in my research for my book. And so I spent some time locating Lone, uh, who's now, you know, eight years later, I guess, but is brilliant in thinking about how we can build movements of accountability and love and respect. So just like I want to honor Sonia Renee, who created Calling On, I want to honor Lone Tran, you know, who's also a trans person, but <laughs> that's just coincidence, uh, for creating the concept of calling in. Absolutely. So what are you most hopeful for in the future for reproductive justice in the human rights movement? Oh, I love young people. Not because <laughs> you're young, you know, because there's young and stupid too. But <laughs> I, I love the energy and the creativity that young people bring to a problem. Mm. Uh, the energy, the, the hopefulness. Uh, the brilliance, the brilliance. I was teaching at Smith College and I misgendered a student once, accidentally. And I froze expecting the student to jump down my throat because you know, getting someone's gender identity right is really important. And I froze expecting you know, to be fiercely called out for getting this wrong. And this student looked at me and said, that's all right, professor. I misgender myself sometimes. And that grace and that forgiveness that student offered me yeah. was so wonderful. I said, this is what we need more of. You know, a student who did not read harm in my mistake who committed to my growth the same way I was committing to their growth kind of thing. Uh, I love that because, you know, the calling out is the expectation that you've already grown, not the recognition that everybody is still growing, mm -hmm. you know? And so I love being and get energized, getting energized and learning new things from young people. That just works for me really well. Now, obviously, there's not everything they do is right or perfect or anything because that's what, you know, there's a whole lot they don't know. Mm -hmm. But I keep in mind when I was that mildly 16 year old. And like I said, the, the elders around me didn't give up on me. And I refused to give up on other mildly 16 year olds because <laughs> I remember what it's like to be one. 
Thank you. So another question that I have is what is your definition of leadership? Um, and to you, what really makes a great leader? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> Ella Baker taught us the concept of servant leadership because a lot of people mistakenly think that leadership is sitting on a throne. And in fact, leadership is how well you serve others. You know, matter of fact, you never anoint yourself the leader. It's the people who believe in you that call you leader. You don't get to call yourself leader kind of thing. Uh, so I hope that any leadership that I've been awarded has been because of how well I work and how hard I work to serve other people uh, to make sure that whatever I do benefits not me, but the people around me. You know, I want to make your life better because of what I do, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I, wrote a, I wrote a paper on qualities of a feminist leader like 30 years ago. And then I had this very idealized list, but I've actually taken it to heart and I've tried to live up to those principles. And it starts with humility and not taking people for granted, not being afraid to say, I don't know, so that you can show your vulnerability, that you don't have to be invincible and all knowing and all that stuff. I mean, those male centric patterns of leadership, it ain't even working for men. So why the hell would we want to try it ourselves kind of thing? And so I, I, I like experimenting with alternative forms of leadership without practicing faux democracy too. Because mm. there is that decentralized, nobody's a leader that, that all that ends up doing is hiding power and disguising power and making people afraid of power. But you can't, you can't change oppressive conditions if you're afraid of power. You need the power to change those op oppressive conditions. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot to be said about how we choose to have leadership and, and what we define as leadership. And I think a lot of that is especially important, important when we look at, you know, a lot of different organizations, even with coalition building, uh, you know, how have you seen coalition building change uh, across your career um, in activism? Well, I would probably argue that the best article on coalition building was, was written by um, Bernice Reagan mm. called Coalition Politics. And I really, really like what she said about uh, understanding that you really can't uh, build a coalition without first understanding who you are, but secondly, figuring out who you need to work with. Mm. You know, and so she was building on what the Combahee River Collective had said in 1977 around identity politics. And then in 83, Bernice wrote her article talking about, well, once you go through that identity politics stage, you know who you are, then you gotta go through the solidarity stage and figure out who you're gonna work with. Kind of thing, who don't share your identity. Mm -hmm. kind of thing and so that's what I believe about coalition politics we are so privileged to have all of this wisdom to mine so that we don't have to figure out everything on our own I love the fact that our elders the people who come before us have offered us so much wisdom if we just slow down and do some research and let's focus on what they call me search you can really find out a lot. So as an academic and as someone who also wants to be a professor, but also do a lot of work with the public, what do you think the role of academia is in these human rights and liberatory movements? And how can we make these more accessible and kind of bridge the gap between the academy and being on the ground? Oh, that's a broad question. I know that I went back to school to get a bachelor's degree, to complete my bachelor's degree and work on my PhD because I wanted to add some theory to my practice. Mm. You know, and so that's what academia can do. 
academia can add explanations for phenomena because of the intense study of those phenomena. But what academia can't do is produce the organic materials of the practices that need to be studied. Yes. Kind of thing. So they get it wrong when they think the theory came first. No, it's the practice. You know, it, it, it is what happens in life that comes first that then academia seeks to explain mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, that, that is one thing. The other thing that kind of frustrates me about academia, and I'm probably going to get in trouble saying this, but trouble is my middle name, like John Lewis says, good trouble is what I do, is that we're really good at gestures without substance. Mm. And one of those things is like our land acknowledgements. You know, yes. We can acknowledge that this land was stolen from indigenous people. We're still at war with those indigenous people over memory, over ownership of land, over rightfulness of belonging in, in this thing called this country. Mm -hmm. so, so for me, I get impatient with the performativity of a land acknowledgement without the acknowledgement. Well, when the hell are you going to give the land back? Mm -hmm. Or at least give scholarships to the, to the descendants of those people you stole the land from so that they can fully participate in your academic institution. I mean, it's just like, let's go be so far beyond our words and our mm -hmm. symbols and our gestures. And yet at academia, we're really good at the symbolic and very bad at the substantive. Mm. Okay. And we're really good at majoring in the minor. <laughs> And the next question I have is, what role do you think story playing, storytelling, excuse me, plays in creating a more nuanced understanding of the unique experiences of marginalized individuals? So particularly um, Black low income, gender minorities, um, like what do you think uh, the, the role of storytelling plays? Well, storytelling is how humans communicate. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, we associate storytelling with a certain survival tactic because, you know, we're the, you know, African Americans are descended from people who were forbidden to read and write or document what had happened to us. So stories became our lifeline, just the way we wrote, you know, we weave maps to the north into our quilting or into our hair braiding or whatever. We had to use whatever mechanics we could to tell our stories and stuff. So they are particularly important to cultures who don't have the privilege of documenting their lives and their experiences and their perspectives other ways. And so they're lifelines. But I find that storytelling is very universal. That there, like I said, I've been to 60, 70 cultures and every one of those cultures has a story it tells about itself a story of who belongs, who doesn't belong, what freedom looks like, what it looks like to take care of your family and your responsibilities and stuff like that. And so I kind of laugh when this whole storytelling industry is now commodified and capitalized on what is basically a survival tactic of, of, of humanity. I remember being at a uh, training sponsored by a you know, multi-billion dollar foundation once. And it was a group of us black women in this training and they brought in this white guy to teach us about the value of storytelling. Uh, oh, wow. It was one of the most surreal experiences in my life <laughs> to have someone say, I'm going, you know, that's, that's what they call the Elvis effect where they take your stuff commodify it, clean it up, and then sell it back to you kind mm -hmm. of feeling. <laughs> it really felt like that. Um, and so uh, Ricky Solinger has written a book on, the, on storytelling. I mean, there's a lot of feminists. I mean, the whole consciousness raising of the feminist movement is storytelling, us telling our stories about what happened to us, how we survived. Um, it is the survivor's tactic. Mm -hmm. 
mm. uh, for the poor a lot part. But it's not just survivors because we're, we're we're at the we we're, we're, we're caught in competing narratives about what is America right now. You know, it, which story are we going to tell ourselves about what this country is supposed to be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is it going to be the country of the ideals that are in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, or is it going to be a slaveocracy permanently run by white men? You know, which story is going to be that which is called the settler colonial state of America? Mm -hmm. So stories are important, but that's how human beings manage and organize how they interact with the world. What stories they tell themselves about who they are and how they should be. Mm -hmm. So the last question I'll ask before I turn it over uh, back to um, Alice and Sawyer is since we've been talking about the commodification of storytelling, what are some ways that you think that we can combat this, uh, this commodification um, and the erasure of basically the originators of, of so many of these concepts and um, arts? Well, I tend to use the Entozaki Shange approach mm -hmm. and she's the one who wrote the Korea poem for colored girls who consider mm -hmm. suicide when the rainbow ain't enough what? yeah anyway she has a line in her Korea poem that says just because they're stolen doesn't make it theirs it's just stolen mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm not gonna fight from the perspective that when they steal something from it it makes it theirs I'm just going to say they just got stolen goods. So I'm mm -hmm. not going to fight on the terrain of the, of the colonizer. I'm going to fight on the terrain of the owner. And from that perspective, kind of, I don't know if that makes any sense. And so I'm going to spend as little time as possible fighting with the thief. And that's the other thing about people stealing stuff. At best, they steal a snapshot. They ain't took the camera. Because mm -hmm. the camera's in you, right? So, I mean, when we talk about cultural appropriation and that and that, I'm like, y'all are just upset because someone snapped a picture of you. And that's all they got is a picture. They and do that not have thing. that fecundity that creates that stuff. Mm. You know, so unless you concede to them the camera, you still own the camera, you know? And while they're trying to profit off of that stuff that it got dated the minute they stole it, you're creating more stuff. So don't let them colonize your mind and heart that way just because they're good pirates. No, that makes perfect sense. That was very beautiful. Thank you so much. Professor Ross, it was such an honor, such, such an honor to speak with you today. Can everyone give Professor Ross a virtual round of applause, turn your cameras off? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. We're so honored to have had you today. I will pass it on to the Women's Center. Hi all, my name is Bisma. I am also an intern with the Women's Center and Professor Ross, as we close down, we just have one um, last question that we would like to ask you. And that is, do you have any last words or calls to action for the seminar? Anything you really want us to take away with us when we leave or anything you would also like to promote? Um, I like the fact that people, particularly young people are operating in such an intersectional way and not letting themselves be boxed into one identity or one way of thinking or one way of being. And so I want to encourage people to continue to see how powerful a stance that is. You know, certainly you don't know everything you need to know, but what you already know is good enough for the moment that you're in kind of thing. And I love that. I love that. Uh, I get exhausted by it sometimes, 
to be honest. But at the same time, I'm glad it's happening because I get exhausted by my personal trainer too. So getting exhausted is not a reason to not keep up doing the work, right? (laughs) And so that's the takeaway. Y'all are Y'all are all that you need to build a bright food future for the world. And we're depending on you to do that. And self-forgiveness for the inevitable mistakes you're going to make. Because part of white supremacist culture is this belief in perfectionism. And then when you get persuaded that you have to be perfect, then you start having all of that imposter syndrome and internalized doubts and all that stuff where you feel you're never good enough for the time that you're in, when in fact you're good enough or better than the times that you're in kind of thing. And so that would be my takeaway, you know. Thank you so much, Professor. And as we close down, we just want to say a huge thank you to Professor Ross for dropping so much knowledge on us tonight. We also want to thank the Association for Black Harvard Women for their collaboration with us. And thank you for everyone for tuning in and joining us. And before you leave, we just want to share this um, quick feedback survey for the event. We'd greatly appreciate if you could take a few minutes to fill it out to help both ABHW and Harvard College Women's Center um, and help us inform us for our future events. And it's been it's been dropped down into the chat if you guys can fill that out really quickly. And though this was a virtual event, the Harvard College Women's Space, located in the basement of Canada B with an accessible entrance in Canada C, is open from 10 to 5 every weekday. Please feel free to stop by for in a warm, inviting space, tea and snacks, sewing workshops, and safe sex supplies. And also, please um, head over to our website and take a look there at all of our initiatives. We encourage you to stop by and stay involved as there will be more events throughout the semester. We also want to recognize and extend a huge thank you to the staff at the Women's Center, especially our staff, Mickey, Bridget, Karen, and Heidi for working so hard to make this happen. Last but most definitely not the least, a special thank you to all the Harvard College Women's Center donors and the Schmitzler Leadership Fund who made this year's seminar so wonderful. We hope you all really have a great rest of the week and please continue to take care of yourselves. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Professor Ross. Take care. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the recording is still going on on YouTube. I don't know how to stop. <laughs> I'm trying to do that right now. Let's.